And that's a pretty profound change because that's driving massive network usage intensity because video eats up a lot of bandwidth. But if you look at the demographics for uh, age groups, the teenagers don't watch that. They watch this. Right? Anybody who has a teenager knows it's true, right? And that has happened literally right away, and it's not going to stop. So that's the third major shift. Now I'll point out, the first shift was telephone, and the carriers made a lot of money from that. The second shift was internet, didn't make that much money from that. The third shift is video, not making any money from that, right? Not, not monetizing it, it's putting a lot of pressure on the carriers. And I think that has implications as we move to 5G. The good news right now is we're seeing an uptick in activity. So, um, you know, I think a couple years ago we were talking about how the CapEx was down in the industry, but all the demand, all the video, unlimited plans are really driving the carriers to now start to invest. And I think we're, hopefully all of us are seeing that uh, day to day to day. But, you know, 15, 16 were pretty, pretty weak. Uh, last year was better. This year's definitely better. And the outlook is really good for the core business. Uh, and, that, and that's just 4G. Here comes 5G. So one point I want to make is there's really two, two 5Gs in the U.S. especially. There's a fixed 5G, which is basically cable replacement. This is primarily AT&T and Verizon uh, getting rid of uh, Uverse and Fios in terms of wires to the home and using wireless to reach homes to deliver cable TV. They came out of the lab early last year and said, wow, 5G to a fixed location, we can get 20, minute, 20 gig speeds and we can get the latency where we can compete offering 70 channels of cable TV and on demand and we don't have to send a truck, we don't have to you know, wire the drop. How many people have had a wire laid across his backyard for longer than you want, right? And they always have to send somebody back. If you call them and say, hey, my signal's not here, the first thing you do is send somebody out there to rerun the drop. That's, really, that's expensive. So, the, 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 in the U.S., fixed 5G is right now. You don't need a, a standard for that. So, uh, it's being rolled out right now. The second 5G, which I'm going to talk more about, is mobility. It's mobile 5G. So, that standard is likely, people in Barcelona were saying, next year. It feels optimistic to me. But I would say for us, you know, the implementation of it, antennas, equipment, etc., is probably 2020. Uh, and that's more what we think of as 5G, I, what I think of as 5G, which is devices moving around. And that requires a standard, it's more complicated, but it is. <coughs> so I think, you know, the reason why you see a lot of uh, excitement around our industry and, you know, certainly the uh, public tower stocks, they, they, they're, 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 they go down, they come right back up. Um, is because there's this layers of demand. We talked about 4G infill, we talked about fixed 5G, now I want to turn to mobile 5G and what it means. And one major headline is, we talked about the shifts, but with 5G, the real business case for investment in 5G is going to be new revenue. So not so much shifts anymore. You have the cable TV shift for fixed 5G, but the real promise of 5G mobility is all the things it enables that we don't have today. So this would be uh, alternate rea altered reality, virtual reality, autonomous cars, remote medicine. There's all kinds of applications that uh, smart cities, sensors, etc. These are th these are things that are new and that require business cases to turn them into revenues. And super important to us that the carriers do that because that's what's going to let them invest. 5G is super expensive, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of sites we'll talk about it, but if they're going to make that investment, and the speed with which they make that investment is going to be a function of it, making some money. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's easy. The other thing is, there's a wild card out there, which is potential new entries. So you have Comcast with Xfinity Mobile selling, mobile, so selling iPhones. Who added more customers in the fourth quarter, Comcast or Sprint? Comcast. 
right? We lost $1.2 billion in the court of doing it. Comcast. So they're, they're not going to stop, right? They, they want to be in the business. At some point, they're going to have to figure out a way to not lose $1.2 billion before they're doing it. And that number's going to go up as customers go up because they're reselling Verizon and they're reselling it arguably in some cases cheaper than what Verizon charges. Is that good? How long is that going to last? So there's a real potential for new entries, I think, as we go forward. And, and, and I think that, that's super exciting. We haven't had that kind of uh, opportunity, I think, in our business in years and years. So what's going to change in the network? Number one, um, 5G deployment is really going to require changes all across the network. We talked about the air interface, which is what 5G is. It's the connection between the device and the closest antenna. That's going to fundamentally change. Um, the, there's going to be a shift from speed. Everything is speed, 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 right? All the, all the metrics, all the measures, all the billboards talk about speed of the network. It's going to shift from speed to also latency, which is something that was mentioned yesterday. Um, but that has profound implications on both the transport, which is front hall, back hall. It's basically the connection back to the core and actually the core of the network. Um, and I'm going I'm to get into that a little bit. But um, 5G really is going to drive a lot of these investments and f push the carriers to spend money across telecom infrastructure. So not just towers, it will be fiber, it will be uh, small cell, it will be data centers. Uh, all parts of common infrastructure are going to uh, are see major investments. One of the, for example, one of the biggest investments in the next five years is going to be Verizon investing in building fiber. They're going to build their own fiber. They don't want, they don't want to pay anybody anymore for a connection to the site they want to own. And tax reform, I, I think uh, Senator Daschle mentioned this yesterday. Tax reform is, is a big, uh, I call it an accelerant. It's like a little uh, jet fuel on the fire for us because these carriers are capital intensive. They pay taxes. ATT, Verizon in particular, pay taxes. So the tax cut absolutely puts cash in their pocket. And those two alone have boosted their CapEx budget for this year by $1.8 billion between the two of them because of tax reform. And they can accelerate their depreciation. It really is a public policy shift to incent investment. And wireless networks require investment. So that's good, that's good for us. So the interface, one, a couple of things we're seeing is one, there's a move to higher frequencies. We all hear about millimeter wave, and it's funny. You know, the, the old commercial <coughs> Instar spectrum was worthless, right? You couldn't, you couldn't give it away five years ago, two years ago. And now, all of a sudden, you know, straight cut, it's bit up into the billions. Because there's been a shift of perspective by the carriers. When I got in the business, lo, those many years ago, um, 800 megahertz was beachfront, right? That's what you wanted. It would propagate really well, it would penetrate buildings, that was where you wanted to be. Um, and in the last really three, four years, there's been a massive shift very rapidly up in frequency. Why? Because the higher frequencies are more controllable. You can densify with those frequencies because they don't go as far and you can control them. The enemy of capacity is interference. It's interference with you, yourself, basically. You want to reuse those frequencies everywhere. So if you have higher frequencies, they don't go as far, and you can densify better. They're also highly um, directional. So that helps the carriers. With the new antenna technology, for beam forming, you can basically focus on an area of hot demand and, and serve it without interfering with the rest of your network. The, you know, one of the things that everybody talks about, and, I, and somebody cited this yesterday, I think it was a million devices per square kilometer on 5G. For sure, 5G enables a tremendous density of devices, uh, whatever they may be, the, you know, the internet of things, so to speak. Um, there will be a lot of densification. There's going to be a lot more sites. They may not look like the sites that we're used to, but there will be a lot more antenna locations to, to meet this demand and to, to generate this kind of speed and, and low latency. 
So, you know, the real attraction that people talk about a lot about, about 5G is speed. And it is important. Uh, you know, it's, it's 20 times faster than 4G in the lab. But the reality is it's going to be about 10 times faster in the real world. So you get 100 megabits reliably instead of 10, um, which is great. It means we can use, we can, we can surf and watch video faster and more, which is, should be good. But the real shift, I think, that, gets, that, that I, I miss sometimes is the importance of latency. So what is latency? Latency is delay. Latency is the time it takes to get a response. So here's what I think of as latency. I want, to walk, I want to change channel on my TV. So where I live, I live in uh, South Florida, in Boca. Um, I have Xfinity. If I do a ping on the internet, it goes to Miami. It goes to Miami. So when I change the channel, it doesn't happen right away. I'm not real patient. I don't like that. Right? Now, I'm not going to die. I feel like I'm going to die. I act like I'm going to die. But that's latency, right? And so as you go forward and you think about applications like autonomous vehicles, remote surgery, right? You can't have it. You cannot have it. So I think I would encourage you to start looking for that word latency and start thinking about and looking for what are the applications that are enabled by low latency because that's a big part of what 5G is, is lower latency in the network. Um, the the so latency appears. There's really three network components. Um, generally, we have latency. One is the air interface, so that's device to antenna. Next is transport, backhaul front home, and then the last is the core network. Okay, those are the three places where um, you have latency. If you look at a typical 4G network, uh, on the left-hand side, the air interface is, I'm being generous, maybe 15 milliseconds, maybe more. Um, transport is a formula, so remember this, I'll say it a couple times. Transport's just a formula. Over fiber, latency is 5 milliseconds per kilometer, and that's, I, I didn't take the class, but I think that's what's called physics. Right? You can't, you're not going to change that. Right? So that's really important. And then in the core today, there's two, three milliseconds of, of delay. Um, but the real, the, the, the big delay is the air difference. So if you look at 4G networks today, um, in January, AT&T was the leader according to Open Signal. All the carriers were pretty close. And it was 58 milliseconds. That's a lot. Right? That, that's what drives me crazy when I change my channel. Uh, you know, if you're if you're video gaming and you're playing somebody and you die in your game because you had 58 seconds milliseconds of delay, you're not going to do that, right? So, uh, typical 4G networks are sort of 50 to 70 milliseconds of latency. Switch over to a 5G network. Um, first thing that you have is the air interface, one millisecond, big shift. So you're taking the sort of the long pole in the tank and you're dropping it to one. That's really important because at the same time you're taking the core and through things like network version, uh, you know, network function uh, virtualization. And, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of that, but that's basically where you're taking the network using software instead of people and you're making it more efficient. You're going to save a couple milliseconds there, right? So the real long pole in the tank transport. Physics can't change, right? So what that really means is you can't take the traffic from Boca to Miami and back for everything. And I saw a, a stat somewhere that said the average bit of data on a wireless network travels over a thousand times. It's insanity, right? That's going to change, okay? And what's going to force it to change is latency because you can't have that. So what happens? You're going to take this core which is your storage, your compute, and your cloud connection, and you're going to move it to the cell sites, or close to the cell sites. It may not be at the cell sites, and I don't think anybody really knows, but you got to move it closer to the sites. Um, 
because that's the only way you're going to lower the latency. So, what are the things that, um, what are the apps that will require latency, or one of the apps in general that these faster speeds and these new networks are going to enable? We talked about uh, alternate reality, virtual reality, multiplayer gaming is one, all the smart city applications, and you know, there's as many ideas as there are um, that you can have out there. We'll see which ones take, and that's going to be the fun part. Let's see which ones actually get get it. Get used and create a bit of real business. But the ones that are dependent on latency are one, remote surgery. We can really up the quality of healthcare, not just in the US in remote areas, but around the world, because you can have the best surgeons performing surgery from wherever they are. But you can't do that if you have 58 milliseconds of latency, because I think that would probably be bad. Um, Autonomous vehicles, something everybody talks about. Uh, clearly, you don't want to have 58 milliseconds of delay. Um, a, uh, on a 4G network, uh, it was on one of the other slides earlier, but on a 4G network, uh, network the, the, the latency in the network, the car will travel another two meters, basically, before it gets a response in current latency. Not so plain, right? Um, with 5G, it'll respond in less than two centimeters, which is basically the response rate of uh, analog braking systems. So you gotta have that, right? You gotta have that. Um, so that, that, I think that's gonna, um, these, you look for these applications because that's really what's gonna drive um, our investments. I do wanna say one thing about unlimited plans. Unlimited plans, I think, will stifle 5G. The reason why I say that is there's no revenue model for the U.S. carriers to make money from 5G. They have to, they have to, so they're going to have to walk back from the limited sum uh, to make money or come up with new business models that aren't subscriber based that give them a way to make money. But if you have an unlimited plan, the carrier, it's interesting, somebody in Barcelona said, um, Ours must be the only industry where customers using the network more is bad. But if you're not making any more money, it's bad. So there's not a lot of incentive to go to 5G just because it's faster. There's got to be revenue. Got to be revenue. So a couple observations, a couple thoughts I'll leave you with. Um, one, and I, this, I, I wrote this before the other day, but um, I, I felt for a while that autonomous vehicles are not going to happen as fast as some people think. And the realization came to me about six months ago where I'm watching the news in the morning, there's a, there's a story about a, a, an accident that happened with an autonomous vehicle somewhere. I'm thinking to myself, shit, there's no part of French. There's an accident on I-95 every five minutes. Why is this a story? It's a story because it's a driverless car. And so we had a horrible example of that this past week. Um, so that's one reason. I think socially, we're not ready. But more importantly, I heard several car manufacturers at Mobile World Congress talk about their fleet. And they're like, look, we sell cars on the road for 15 years. We're not just going to come out with these new kind of cars that obsolesce our existing fleet. We can't do that. We're not going to do that. They make money on those cars with service and parts. They're not going to do that. Um, so I think it's more like 10 years than 5 years, uh, if you ask me. But it's coming. Um, I think I think the U.S. carriers are going to pull away from unlimited. There's going to be flavors of unlimited. Verizon already started. You have you know three different versions of unlimited. I think they have to. That's my personal opinion. I think they have to um, because they have to find a way to monetize um, these investments, which are big and. It's very hard to come up with new revenue models. You know, it's not, the history of the big wireless carriers is probably that, you know, for the most part, they haven't done that. They've just been cannibalizing other, other things. And I think, you know, other, other, just basically taking advantage of anybody who would rather do a wireless than one. But they have to go beyond that, and that's hard. So I think you'll see them when they did start to get modified. I would guess, um, as soon as uh, Time Warner's worked out for AT&T, something, something, you'll see some announcements of Verizon's already started. 
uh, but I think it's coming. Uh, and it's not all bad. It's not all bad. Um, the, um, I think you'll see, you know, the, there's a lot of, uh, Senator Dash will talk about regulatory changes in policy. There's a lot of push uh, around small cells. Uh, Jonathan mentioned it as well yesterday. There's a lot of push for legislation to uh, streamline the small cell siting process, which I think is generally good. Um, but to the extent that carriers are arguing that 5G is going to be the solution to rural and underserved areas, I think they're going into dangerous space. When you look around the world, there are real coverage requirements in other countries. We don't really have that. It's not hard to meet the licensing requirements to keep your license. Uh, Dish is about to show that. Um, but you go around the world, like in Brazil, they, they'll shut you off. You can't sell any new phones if you don't meet certain requirements for coverage. And, and this, we're talking about rural and underserved areas. We don't have that. But if the justification for 5G regulatory changes is we're going to serve underserved areas, it's pretty obvious the next question is, okay, well, what are you required to do? Right now, the answer is nothing. So I think there's a Pandora's box there that I think may be open. So I would watch for that kind of a, uh, of a move. Um, I think that the U.S. carriers are going to lead on the cable TV replacement, the over-the-top cable TV replacement, but I get the, I get the, got the strong sense coming out of Mobile World Congress that really European and Asian carriers are going to lead on new revenue. <coughs> and interesting, a lot of what they talk about is data, which is in the news right now, right? All the data of your usage isn't, going, isn't being used by the carriers to make money. Other people are making money on it. Facebook's making money on it, right? Um, I think that's going to start to shift because that's a big, a big focus in Europe for the carriers is how do we take data, refine it, sell it as part of our revenue model. And the example was a barrel of oil is 65 bucks, but if you refine it, you can sell it for multiples of that. And they're looking at data that way. I think the CDRS spectrum that was mentioned, 3.5, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but this is going to turn into a food fight, big time food fight, because you got the carriers interested, uh, the cable companies are interested, um, the FANGs, which is Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, they're, they're interested. By the way, those five companies, their market cap, $3 trillion. Take the top 10 telcos in the world. Market cap, $1 trillion. Think about that. And uh, I heard the CEO of Vodafone say, the largest communications company in the world is Facebook. Facebook, right? Completely unregulated. So if you have a phone number, if, if you're a company and you issue phone numbers, you're regulated. If you issue internet email addresses, you're not regulated. Right? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but that, that, that's the way it is right now. So I think you'll see um, push for leveling the regulatory playing field, whatever that means. But you, I think that's, that's something you're going to see. Um, really important, I said it before, the pace of 5G investment in the U.S could be directly related to the revenues that the carriers can generate. If it's just faster, what, so I'm going to spend all this money to let my customers use more of the unlimited data faster? Doesn't really work, right? They're in a box. So it really is going to be a function of what are applications that are going to take off? What will people pay for? What will anybody pay for? New applications make money drive 5G. So I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that the 5G rollout is going to be as fast as 4G was, which was very fast, right? That was three years everybody basically rolled it out. I don't, I don't see that yet. Now, I would look outside of the U.S. <coughs> for examples of where this is being monetized because that's, I think, where it's going to come from. Hopefully the cable overbuild will be terrific. You know, I think we all want the carriers to be very successful and make a lot of money, and they need to, because these are, this is, you know, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. Um, 
the last the last thing I'll leave you with is I think the ingredients are there for something we haven't seen in the U.S. in a long, long time, which is a new network. So they have something in Mexico called Altan. Altan is a license. It was a license that was sold by the Mexican government, wireless spectrum, for a basically a pay-as-you-go non-carrier network, and it was built last year. So. Our, our sister company, Mexico Tower Partners, had more new leases last year than the prior six years combined. And it's because it's a new network. I think the ingredients are here that I think something will happen. And what I mean by that is you have Comcast selling phones and losing a boat. By the way, here comes Charter. Watch, watch the news this summer, they're gonna do the same thing. So they're gonna be selling phones, reselling service and losing money all the way along. At some point, they have to get owner economics. They have to put a network, something out there so they can capture those revenues without the expense. So that, that's on the cable side. Meanwhile, carriers are coming into their neighborhood and offering over the top of 5G. But then you look at the fans, right? Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. All their traffic is coming via wireless. There's no more net neutrality right now in the U.S., which means net neutrality means non-discriminatory. A carrier, a carrier can't discriminate by traffic, so right now they can. So you're going to see. You may not. We may not see it in the paper. This is what's about to happen, right? Hey, Netflix. My usage goes like this. It's to my customers using your network. If you want them to have a good experience. Pay that's put, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the fans. Remember, three trillion of market cap to do something. So I think there's a lot of ingredients out there: dishes, spectrum, autonomous vehicles. All the all the car companies are interested. John Deere is it looking. There's a lot since everything's moving wireless. There's a lot of pressure to figure out how do we get to the customer and not necessarily go through the existing carriers. So I think we will have a new entry in the U.S. It may be buying an existing company. Uh, it may be a new network. I think uh, one last thought I'll leave is it's a lot easier to build a low latency, high speed 5G network today from scratch than necessarily it is upgrading. Certainly some of the networks that are out there upgrading them is very expensive and high. So I would say at some point in a future South Wireless Summit, Two, three years from now, maybe sooner, we'll be talking about a new, a new carrier, a new play in the market. Um, thanks very much. I hope you got something out of it. I uh, appreciate it. I will. Steve says I have, I have time to take questions. I'm happy to do it. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, so the question was around the third network. Yeah, so, so what, the way I look at it is you've got, you know, Dish has a lot of spectrum out there. You have, you know, Google's been looking at ways to access customers directly, Google Fiber, Google Access. Um, it's not lost on them at all that the majority and growing part of their traffic is coming through wireless. They're paying attention when they see Verizon say, well, unlimited, really, there's three kinds of unlimited. There's base unlimited, there's, you know, that, and, and they know that net neutrality is gone. So I think that um, they're going to have a make versus buy decision that they're going to have to make. They're going to have to decide, you know, am I going to pay to continue to receive what I, you know, continue to have my customers receive this service, or am I going to go? And I think it'll be, you know, when we talk about headnets, to me that's the headnet, right? If you're looking at what Comcast's doing when you think about Google, it's going to be a combination of reselling and owner economics where they can't, where they have a lot of traffic. 
And I think one thing I would say is, you know, certainly Google, very sophisticated about where their users are and what they're doing. Very sophisticated. So they don't have to build a 100% coverage of the U.S. in the moment, but they will put their own owner economics in certain places where it makes sense. And I think, I think, uh, I think it's going to happen. I really do. Yeah, I think, and, and, and the push is going to be, uh, and maybe it's already happening, the more the carriers are saying to them, and I, I, when I say carriers, it's really ATT, I think, and Verizon are saying to them, listen, pay me. Pay me. My, my traffic is going like this, and my revenues per user is like this, and it's going like this because of you, Netflix. So I'm either going to change what they get, or you're going to change what I get. <laughs> I'm going to give you more money. Um, I, I, I think that's inevitable. As long as there's no net neutrality. And by the way, I think that um, there's good, because of this data issue with Facebook, I think that's the opening salvo. I think there's going to be a much stronger move now for regulation of the fans. Because when you think about it, you know, the, the carriers are, the wireless carriers are heavily regulated. The fans are not regulated at all. They're 10 times bigger. They're way bigger. And so I think that that's what's going to be part of the mix as well. Thanks. Alex, uh, I want to thank you for being here. Kirk Ridge, you are our first trial sponsor. We want to pass to you all your own platinum record. Damn. Can you just say?